between what was done to the cruise lines and what is allowed for everybody else. Crackdown on cruises. The Trump administration says no more cruises to Cuba. And Congressman Mario diaz Balart approves the Miami Republican is with us live. Of course, Mr. Peterson, we expect to be treated fairly, just like every other third person. Criminally charged an unprecedented arrest of a former Broward Sheriff's deputy for what he didn't do at Douglas High. We will take it to the round table. I mean, how much does it cost for a soccer ball and for uh, uh, one of the workers to watch him play soccer? Shelter is shocked. No more soccer, school, art, or attorneys for thousands of migrant teens held in Homestead. A bad situation gets worse. Good morning. South Florida again takes center stage this week in the ongoing and multi-layered issues around processing, absorbing, or deporting a spiking number of migrants. This week we learned that 2,500 migrant teens being held at the detention center in Homestead no longer are going to get to take classes, play soccer, or other sports, and they will stop getting attorneys to represent them and protect their rights. The Department of Health and Human Services says they've got to cut those programs because they are simply running out of money. They're already spending about $750 a day for each teenager at that detention center. That's more than $2 million a day to house, feed, provide basic medical services, and try to place those kids with family members or sponsors. Three South Florida members of Congress, all Democrats, denounced the cutbacks in services at the detention facility, and one of them is calling for the resignation of the Secretary of Health and Human Services. Alternatively, the House passed this week a bill granting a path to citizenship for the Dreamers and others in the country with temporary protected status. That bill passed with almost unanimous support of Democrats and seven Republicans. And one of those Republican yes votes was cast by our guest, Representative Mario diaz Ballard. He is a Republican who has served in Congress for the last 17 years. He represents the 25th Congressional District, much of Southwest Miami-Dade, Hendry Collier counties, much of the Everglades. Congressman, good morning. A lot Great of alligators in, in that district. Good to see you all. Good to see you <laughs> a all. A huge district. Uh, we will get to this whole breaking, developing mm -hmm. story on tariffs and immigration, mm -hmm. but first about the Homestead Detention Center. The fact that the announcement this week that these kids down there will not get classes in English or anything else, can't play soccer, uh, that all these activities to keep these kids occupied are being cut out. And that's unfortunate. But the reason, it's not that anybody wants to cut them out. It's because they are running out of money, as you all just mentioned. And they are running out of, out of, out of money because the Democratic leadership in the House has refused to add any funding for it. And so remember that for a long time they were saying that this is a fabricated crisis, a fabricated crisis. Well, now everybody understands that it's not a fabricated crisis. It's a real crisis. Right. We need to put money. Um, not only for the detention centers, but that's a big part of it. And unfortunately, the Democratic leadership has, ref and some on the more radical left of the Democratic members of the House, some uh, have also refused to put any money. Let me, let's talk money for a mm -hmm. moment, because at this particular facility that you, you've been in. I have. Uh, in Homestead, $750 per detainee per day Correct. is what is being spent here which we've learned is so much more than the per day dollar amount at smaller shelters, the nonprofits that are run. And there is a huge outcry that this is a for-profit contracted facility. And so if you would, Congressman, speak to the fact that the detention center in Homestead, where it's so expensive, ramping up to 3,200 beds in the coming mm -hmm. months, is a for-profit facility. Why is it a for-profit facility, and how can profit not be a motive for filling it up? Well, look, the reason it's being filled up is because these individuals have to be placed someplace. As opposed line. to somewhere else. As opposed to somewhere else. But this is a large facility that's been there. By the way, it's been there. This is not a Trump administration facility, as you know. Right. Number one. Number two is, look, I've been there. They provide, frankly, very, very important, a very important service. They do so in a way that is safe. They provide education, schooling, health care. Yes, right. that's all exceedingly expensive. Um, and so here's the problem whether it's this facility or other facilities, they're all having to cut back because of lack of funding. And so, um, I repeat, there were some that said that there was no crisis, there was no increase in the numbers. That has been shown to not be the case. Yeah. If you have so many new folks coming in the system, 
with no additional money, this is not rocket science, Glenn. It's, it, it, something's going to have to give. Obviously, it can't be safety. It can't be the safety of these uh, children. So therefore, it's going to have to be yeah. their leisure activities, which is unfortunate. Yeah. Congressman, uh, you are three congressional colleagues from South, South Florida, yes. Debbie McCursell <clears throat> Powell, uh, Donna Shalala, Debbie Wasserman Schultz. They all, money for them is not the issue. They think there should be more money to Correct. be able to provide these programs. So who is holding this up and why? What do they want in return? I'm very careful. I don't talk about Democrats or Republicans, but when you're looking at the Democratic leadership in the House, um, because I'm on the Appropriations Committee, as is Debbie uh, Wasserman Schultz, by the way, and she does a phenomenal job there. We work very closely together. But we have not gotten the Democratic leadership to agree to put any additional, su sufficient additional money to deal with the numbers, the increased yeah. numbers, of folks coming across the southern Let's border. Let's put, put the number on that, um, 144,000 yeah. migrants in May. That we know of. Okay, well, the, the, that I found on the graph. Correct. Is more than double of any month in the past five years Correct. and 30% more than April. So there is a number that is really shocking. Right. That said, let's talk about the detention center inside. I've been there, you've been there, mm -hmm. the, the three congresswomen have all been there. Um, the Flores attorneys for this, the Flores agreement, this 20-year-old agreement that sets the standards for care, they've been there. And the reports out of there are shockingly different. Uh, Prison-like system, yeah. kids abused and neglected, is that what you saw? No, no, it's not what I saw at all. Now, look. And, uh, and for and, the record, I did not either. Right, not that they're, not that right. it's a great situation, but. That's right. Look, and, and yeah. the thing is this, if there is one incident, instance of abuse it's one too many and so but but what you see in the facility here in Homestead are kids that are being treated well is it the place that you and I would want to be our, our kids to be there no these are of kids course. that are in detention obviously but they are treated well they're giving all they're, they're also you know given all these other activities whether it's health care whether it's actual activities whether it's education uh, which I think is a good thing unfortunately when you have the numbers growing at the at the rate that you just showed, and yet the Democratic leadership and some members of the Democratic Party saying that that was not true, well, something has to give. What do we have to do? We have to fund the detention centers. We have to fix the situation on the southern border. Uh, and, we, and by the way, I will tell you, the administration, I have disagreements with the administration, but I think they're pressuring Mexico, as they're doing now, is the right thing to do, because what is not true is when the Democratic leadership and some on the left were saying that this was a created crisis. It's a real crisis. They refused to put the money, and now we're going to see the consequences of that refusal if we don't act soon. Well, I'm not an attorney, but let's say I will stipulate to the crisis. I think anybody who opens their eyes and so looks That's at right. the situation on the border knows it's a crisis. Now, on Friday, the president announced after hard negotiations between Mexico and the United States that uh, his 5% uh, tariffs would not go into effect tomorrow, Monday, and that Mexico was going to agree to really try to act aggressively to stop the huge amount of migrants who are coming across their southern border. Uh, but then the New York Times reports today that those agreements have been in place for a couple of months. That this they haven't been real But they haven't been enforced. And so it's an issue. Look, there's nothing new here. You know, there's, none of these issues are brand new. And so with the administration, I will tell you, uh, I agree with them on, uh, on some foreign policy issues. I agree with them on how they're pressuring China. And it seems to have, uh, it's having the results, hopefully, that we want, which is to, to curtail some of the problems that we've had with China. And that's a bigger issue. Uh, they're now pressuring Mexico to do what has been agreed to mm -hmm. by Mexico for now some time, but they haven't done so. So some of, some of the things that are in the, the agreements are Mexican National Guard at the border, 600,000 mm. eventually, tightening Mexico's border with Guatemala, and, and what's interesting is accepting more asylum seekers yeah. from Central America in Mexico, although I think, you know, I'm reading that Mexico's asylum system is fairly broken. Mm -hmm. But then this morning, the president had a, a little bit of a tweet storm this morning, and among his tweets talked about something that hasn't been talked about as part of that agreement. Do you know what that is? I don't. I don't. I'm not, uh, you know, I'm not in, involved in the details of those negotiations. What I think is important is for the United States, when you have, and, and Mexico is an ally, it's a, it's, a, it's a business trading partner of the United States, yeah. frankly, a very important one. It's important for our economy. But one of you, you mentioned, you mentioned, for example, some of the issues that are that are broken. Asylum. 
this, the asylum system is broken to the point where those who really have legitimate asylum claims can't get here through that process because the lines are so, so, so long by folks abusing the process. And so um, I, I, I like the fact that the administration is pressuring, in some cases, our adversaries like China, and in some cases, our friends and our allies like Mexico to adhere to some of the things that they've said that they were going to do in the past to make sure that we protect those who are seeking asylum, who need asylum, but also to stop some of the abuses. And the abuses when you're dealing with the folks crossing the border, particularly who are the biggest victims, are women, are girls. Uh, you ask folks um, what percentage of young girls are sexually abused mm -hmm. trying to get to the United States, and the number would astonish all of us and the, what they have to go through. So again, we have to remember that there are real victims. These are not numbers. So when folks say there's not a crisis, you're right, Michael, there is a crisis. There has been a crisis. This president is trying to address it. I don't always agree with how he addresses all these things, but he's trying to address it. And in the case of Mexico, it looks like they're finally starting to respond. All right. Hold on. We've got more questions, including questions about the future of Venezuela. Yeah. So stick with us. We'll be back with Congressman diaz Bolart after the break. Welcome back. We are speaking this morning with Congressman Mario diaz Balart, Republican from the 25th District. Congressman, the impasse in Venezuela continues between Juan Guaido and Nicolas Maduro. But this weekend, Maduro opened the bridges, the border to Colombia. Hundreds of thousands, apparently, Venezuelans went over to buy the medicine and food they cannot buy, right. you know, at home. So where does this go from here? Will the humanitarian aid that was stockpiled over the last couple of months, will that be able to move into Venezuela? I'm hoping it does. Look, here's the interesting situation. So you have Maduro who controls guns but doesn't control the country. You have Guaido who doesn't control any guns but who walks around freely in the country while Maduro's locked up in a base. And so this new reality of the last five months, uh, is it an impasse? I don't think so. If you look at 
what has happened in the last but five Guaido months. But Guaido hasn't been able to bring down Maduro. That's and Maduro correct. hasn't been able. If he arrested Guaido, Ooh. then <laughs> the, the Lima group, then there would be a huge uh, ramification. I think if he arrested Guaido or, or did anything like that to Guaido, I think, uh, I, th I don't, I don't uh, President Trump has been very clear, this, administra this administration has been very clear that Guaido's safety Right. is a national security issue of the United States, and therefore uh, I think that would be the last mistake mm -hmm. that the uh, Maduro folks make. Congressman, this week in an effort to keep Cuba out of Venezuela, right. the administration cracked down on cruises, on travel, and that was a, a, a big upheaval on both sides of, of the water. And so um, you favor that. You've been consistently hardline mm -hmm. in the policy against Cuba. And so my question to you is the backlash on U.S. businesses and U.S. travelers, which by the, stat by the uh, statistics does not make up a huge portion of business to Cuba. I is that something that is worth what happened? Look, it is because the law is very clear, which is, in the first place, what is the policy of this administration? Deny funds to the dictatorship in Cuba that, by the way, is using those funds to repress its people and to also do bad things in places like Venezuela, Nicaragua, and Bolivia, and elsewhere. And so that's the policy. I think it's the right policy. The law has always been that way. Under the previous administration, they allowed, they basically pushed the envelope of the law, saying that cruises, cruise ships, are not tourism. Now look, that doesn't pass a straight face test. Um, and so this administration is, essence, is, in essence, enforcing the law. The purpose of the policy of the law is to uh, deny as much as possible funds reaching the regime and, and, and these tours, uh, when they get there, part particularly the tours that were arranged on the ground, yeah. well, are all involved with the regime. So therefore, yeah. it's good policy and it's, it shouldn't people. surprise anybody. So look, can we just drill down into sure. that, Philip? There are under, um, there's 12, essentially 12 categories, categories that correct. Americans can travel. And the people to people category, which a lot of opponents called the sham from the beginning, correct. is what has been eliminated and that's why the cruises have been eliminated. Correct. But there is still a category called support for the Cuban people category. Right. What's the difference? If you can, for example, not deal with the regime. So one of the things that, that the uh, law allows for is if people want to go there to help to meet with the, uh, the ladies in white, they can do so. If they want to stay in places that are not controlled by the regime, they can do so. Unfortunately, a lot of these people-to-people -people travel groups have been arranged on the ground through entities that are associated with the regime. The hard currency has gone to the regime. That is precisely the kind of thing that is bad for our national security interests, it's bad for the hemisphere like Venezuela and Nicaragua. And by the way, frankly, it's against the spirit, if not the letter of the law. Yeah. Congressman, uh, the Miami Herald, immediately after the new policy was announced, ran, I thought, a very strong editorial supporting the Trump administration on this. And it said, among other things, we think the new restrictions will send a stinging message that will get Cuba to realize there is a price to pay for its interference in the Venezuelan crisis. Do you think the Cuban government, do you think that they will get this message and change, move out of Venezuela? The, I don't think the so. The regime is the regime, right? We know it. it's the same regime that's been there for 60 years. Um, the question is, what is better for the national security interests of the United States and what is better for the Cuban people? To help fund that regime with hard currency or to try to make it harder so that that regime uh, cannot pay for its repression and it cannot expand yeah. and, imp and export? That repression. Yeah, well, let's put up on the screen. I just want people at home to understand how large this is exactly. Uh, according to uh, uh, John Kavalajic at the U.S. Cuba Trade Economic Council, uh, in 2018, about 800,000 U.S. citizens were passengers on cruise ships. That's really an impressive number. And each of those visitors, the cruise ships paid, cruise line companies paid the Cuban government $8 per per visitor. Uh, and the aggregate total, as Glenna said earlier, is estimated between sixty-seven and hundred and three million dollars, which is not chum change, but you know, it really is how much money is this for for Cuba and for the regime? Yeah, it's again, it's also the fact that the, a lot of the tours on the island, uh, a lot of run those run by the government. A lot of those or or run by the, either the regime or those associated with the regime. But again, this is the key. Look. 
is it what's better for the national security interests of the United States, for the people of Cuba, and for the Venezuelans who are now suffering because of the 20 to 25,000 Cubans, uh, to help fund the regime that's doing all those horrible things, or to deny hard currency to that regime? Yeah. Clearly, in our national security interests, for the, for the interests of the Cuban people and of the Venezuelans and Nicaraguan people and the Bolivians, it's better to deny yeah. hard currency to the regime that's using those funds to do yeah. bad things. So, so why so then? So you would, uh, just one follow-up. So if Richard Fain from Royal Caribbean called you up and said, hey, Mario, come on down and talk to me, and you're willing to sit down with him or people from Carnival Absolutely. or uh, MSC or the other cruise lines and say, we're sorry, you got in bed with a dog and you got up with fleas. Is that sort of the theory? I have a great relationship with, with these folks. I think uh, you, you mentioned uh, Mr. Fain. Uh, you know, yeah. I, I'm a huge admirer of, of, of Mickey Harrison, who's always been exceedingly sensitive to the cause of, of right. Cuba. Uh, but I think they would tell you that early on, when they started looking at doing this, I told them, I said, look, I understand that the, the Obama administration is pushing that, but the law, the law does not allow it, and you're kind of betting that, that President Obama's going to be in the and White House forever. Yeah. And, and it's unfortunate, because look, ran into him and he yeah. was always well I don't want people to get hurt I don't want businesses to get he was always the way he was special guy you right. hurt but whether it's doing business on special guy all right, right. congressman yeah, thanks. thanks very much golden property of Americans or whether it's doing all right up next we're gonna take all the weeks out uh, business to help that helps fund topics to the roundtable stay with us uh, give hard currency to an anti-american American terrorist narco trafficking regime that is doing bad things around the world and this hemisphere in particular. Um, that's not what they should be doing. Um, I understand why they did it. They got a lot of pressure by the way, by the previous administration to do it. Um, but again, the law is clear, and the policy is the right policy. And the airlines, American airlines that fly there, why, why are those different? Yeah, because the, the administration has decided, and by the way, the law, law is also the, that, that um, family travel to visit relatives is permissible and therefore they've determined that that's the way they can do it. I would tell you, however, that those airlines have to be very, very careful to make sure they're not doing business on property that were stolen from Americans. Yeah. Because if they were, uh, they're probably going to get sued. Right. And there is, of course, a family that says, we used to own the airport in Havana. So that suit, I think, uh, has yeah. been filed. or Correct. Assumed... Will be. And there will be, I think there are going to be other suits. And... But, but I, I remind people, if they're not doing business, business on property that was stolen from, from Americans, yeah. they have nothing to fear. Congressman, Congress great, great to have you. Can I just very, uh, my heart goes out to the entire family and thank Todd's you. family uh, uh, for you. that
Well, there was a welter of news, we could say, this week, which means we have got a lot to talk about today with our Powerhouse Roundtable. Well, let's tell you who's with us this morning first. Stephen Johnson is a Miami attorney who chairs Miami-Dade County's Black Affairs Advisory Board, and he is also the president of the 100 Black Men of South Florida. Marily Cancio is an attorney with her own name firm in Miami, very active in the Republican Party locally and nationally. And Chris Smith is an attorney in Fort Lauderdale and active in the Democratic Party locally and nationally. He is a former state rep and a state senator from Broward County. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Great to have you. Get your own law firm here this yeah, morning. You know, I, I was just thinking <laughs> that there's a... <laughs> Two non-lawyers. A, a lot right of here. lawyers with a timed show. <laughs> this could be fun. Yeah. <laughs> Stephen, let me begin by asking, I want to hear from each of you, but let me begin by asking you, you know, we heard Congressman diaz Bellart express, you know, disappointment, uh, a sadness that these kids who are down there, 2,500 or so, uh, at this detention facility won't be able to go to class, won't be able to have any recreation outdoors. You know, all these programs are being cut back, but he says, well, if the Democrats would agree and give us the money, we'd be able to do it. I, I mean, what's, so, your, what's your take? Interesting, the congressman actually says $750 per day per child. There are 1,000 children there. That's 750,000. They want to go it's to- almost 3,000 Well, they want to, uh, yeah. uh, when I saw, they wanted to expand it <laughs> yeah. to 3,000. Yeah. That's going to be $2.1 million yes. a day. So you can't find an hour for soccer? Mm. Soccer balls are not that expensive. Yeah. And that's what they're paying now. You know, the, the, um, that's sad to hear, yeah. but the fact that legal representation is being curtailed, Mary Lee, it sounds, mm -hmm. that almost sounds like it, it's an inviting and a lawsuit of some sort. That, that's statutory, that's constitutional. How is that even possible? I think last time I was on the show, we talked about these mind-boggling numbers of $750 right. mm -hmm. per person and all the millions of dollars per day. Uh, the problem is the numbers of people that are coming illegally and these facilities are overcrowded. There's no more money for more uh, border security and I think the funding is the main issue. As Congressman diaz Ballard mentioned, we need the funding. Without the funding, they're going to have to focus on security, the well-being, feeding uh, these children. But how do, you, how do you not provide legal representation for a legal migrant? That, that just that just defies it's, it's logic. Just, if these right. kids are being held hostage, mm -hmm. their legal representation, their physical attributes, their 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 everything they're going through is being held hostage in this political game of, okay, is this a crisis? How much we're going to pay for it and stuff? Whereas we need to focus on making sure these kids that are in our custody, in our custody, are being yeah. taken care of, and, and it's like they're being held hostage by yeah. politicians. Well, these psychologists, lawyers who have filed a suit you know, in response to, they believe, violating the Flores Agreement, mm -hmm. which says the government yes. can hold children up to 20 days and then have to place them with either family or sponsors. Uh, these kids are down there. I mean, Glenna, you've been there. Uh, sometimes they're down there for months, months while they are being processed. Now, to give the, the Caliber and Company its due, mm -hmm. since it opened, I read that there are 12,000 kids who have gone through that facility. 9,700 have been placed and are out. Okay. But, I mean, the idea that 3,000 kids are going to be down there all day, merrily without agree. classes, without uh, a recreation, I mean, these are kids 13 to 17. What do you, yeah. you, know, what do you expect? Uh, my, gonna... my granddaughter, who's here in the studio with me, she goes to public school, and she doesn't have recess, and it's also a matter of funding. So I agree with you that we need to find a way to be able to care for these kids properly. You know what was very interesting to me reporting this this week? The the fact that they have to withhold services is, is an, an act. It's called the Anti-Deficiency Act. You can't provide services that aren't being funded. Mm -hmm. But part of the Anti-Deficiency Act is they cannot accept volunteer services. Yeah. So people, I've gotten calls, how can I help the kids in Homestead? People who want to volunteer maybe as a for legal representation or a coach for, so they can play soccer. Yeah. On, uh, under the and, act are not allowed to do and that. That adds to what I said, playing the politics with kids. It's like we're going to make our point and we're going to make people suffer. And, and you see it all the time in politics in, in the whole realm, not just this. But, you know, let's make people suffer to truly push the point 
and try and get some change and to not allow volunteers down there to coach yeah. soccer, to teach English and those right. things. Well, a Miami-Dade County School Superintendent Alberto Carvalho on a number of occasions has said, let us in. We will provide yes. the teachers. We will teach these kids. But this is a federal facility which is outside the realm HHS of state law. HHS addressed that, actually. Uh, HHS reps in Homestead said that they had gone to the district for teachers, but teachers can't be provided for a temporary job. Um, that was HHS reaction to that. And well, let me let me say this: we've got to figure a way out of this, and I'll tell you why. There's a lot of talk these days mm -hmm. about whether or not America's great or making it great. You can't be great without being magnanimous, and you can't be magnanimous if you're going to have children sitting, for all intents and purposes, in 24-hour lockdown with nothing to do, mm -hmm. no education, no recreation. That's absurd. The congressman said you wouldn't want your children there, but it's okay. No, 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 no. No education, no recreation. We wouldn't want anyone's children Well, isn't the answer speeding up the process to get them out? Well, look, listen. And, and that's, that's the back, there is a backlog. And we are having political fights right now about what that process is. Look, the Senate has said we're not going to take up the, the Dreamers Act of 2019. Great, wonderful. At some point, we need to figure out what we're going to do about this problem. And it's not a one-shot solution. It has to be holistic because it's a problem we all have. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I agree. All right, so hold your thoughts, everybody. We've got so much more to talk about with the roundtable when we come back. We're glad to have you back with us live in our studio this morning. We are in the midst of a really interesting roundtable with Stephen Johnson, Mara Lee Concio, Chris Smith. Uh, Mara Lee, uh, we also spoke with uh, Congressman diaz Ballard about the fact that he was one of seven Republicans who voted for the Dream and Promise Act, which would give a path to citizenship for not just Dreamers, but people with TPS, two and a half million migrants who are in this country who need legal status, but that's going nowhere in the Senate. And that is because uh, 
the Senate controlled by Republicans want a comprehensive solution to immigration reform. Well, can't you do and, this incrementally? Well, I, I yeah. agree uh, with Congressman Diaz Ballard, and I am in favor of helping dreamers as soon as possible. But what's going to happen two years from now when we have hundreds of thousands of people coming, 144,000 last month. Yeah. We've had more people come in the first five months of 2019 than in the entire 2018. So we're gonna have this problem again in two years from now, five years from now. But are the, the dreamers yeah. and the people who are included in this particular bill are a, a set number of people? Yeah. I mean, the, yeah, there's a, at, there's at, a line At there. some point, you know, to go to a football analogy, at some point you gotta get a first down mm -hmm. and not just try to get that mm -hmm. touchdown. Why is it always sports? It always goes to sports. He's a seminal. <laughs> but, no, no, it's a seminal, <laughs> I'm getting ready. But I mean, this is a, this is a great first down. I mean, the House passed it. And we see our local delegation, mm -hmm. who is in, I mean, is, is deeply embedded in this, mm -hmm. are supporting it. And this is a time when the Senate can say, okay, we, let's take this off the table as we move forward and try to get comprehensive immigration reform. But at least on this, we all agree, let's get this off the table and move it forward. And I think the American people support it. Uh, well, the yes. majority of Americans they support do. that. Yeah. Let, let me tell you, that. we have, we just did, the 100 Black Women in South Florida just did a program for children at, at one of the Miami high schools. It was a financial literacy program. Two of the children, at the end of the program, we gave everyone a check for participating so that they can go get banked and mm -hmm. do the things that you uh, would do That's with right. your financial <laughs> literacy. Two of the children were unbanked because of their immigration status. And now we're struggling with they that. They couldn't open a bank account? Exactly. And we're talking about high school seniors who had been here since yeah. they were children. Yeah. So, so were they, they are the dreamers? They so. literally, if, if you're thinking about who these people are, they go to school with your children, they, they, you work next to them every day, they're going to find themselves not being able to participate in this greater thing we call the American dream, and that's what's wrong. Yes. We've got to fix it. And Republicans could actually take a ballywick from the Democrats by saying, you know what? Yeah, here's your path. Now give me my wall. You know, it's um, that would be scary for, for, <laughs> for a Democrat like me. That'd be well, the scariest yeah, thing well, in the world. As a matter, mm -hmm. matter of fact, even the Washington Post, I think, mm -hmm. you know, center left newspaper last year said, all right, give the dreamers a path to citizenship and fund some of the wall. Yeah. yeah. So it's not an impossible But that was on the proposal. table last year, I believe. It when, was. Yes, that yeah. was on the table last year. And the Democrats refused it. So they continue to play politics on both sides. There was an election going on at the time. <laughs> you know, you can't yeah. do those things. But what, what I'm saying is, and it's interesting, immigration, and we've talked about earlier, it's going to require a holistic approach. And on some of these, we need to make sure that folks have a path to citizenship. And on others, we need to stem a tide that's coming. So, yeah. right, but to Michael's point, it, the holistic approach is critical, but you have a, a, a specific problem here, and they are dreamers, 800,000, yeah. mm -hmm. plus 1.6 million more because they there are register. the dreamers are registered. The government knows where to find them. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so that's a scary prospect for them. And then there's all this 1.6 who are not registered. And so these are people with a very specific problem that is addressed yeah. in this bill. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we'll have to deal with this huge influx that is coming you know, down the road. Uh, if I can, let's kind of pivot here. Okay. I want to look mm -hmm. at a big story out of Broward County uh, <laughs> yeah. this week. And Chris right. Smith, let me ask you about this. Scott Peterson, former school resource officer, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas, is charged with, ch charged with child abuse and neglect and perjury. Uh, these charges against a police officer for failing to do his job, yes. you know, are just unprecedented. What do you think, you're a good lawyer, what do you think's <laughs> gonna happen here? Well, I think it opens up Pandora's box. Because just think about your viewers and something you guys covered uh, tremendously was the incident in Coral Springs where the officers um, pepper sprayed the child and took him yeah. to the ground and gave him kidney punches. I mean, that's child neglect, that's child abuse. And I mean, you, we see it constantly. So by charging this officer with these crimes, now um, the state attorneys and both counties have opened themselves up to every time we see these types of incidents, mm -hmm. okay, if yeah. child abuse is not going in and doing your job, what well, about taking a kid yeah, down? I should have said it's child neglect. Child neglect. I think is it, the actual yeah. mm -hmm. uh, charge. But it's interesting, Marilee, the, the Broward State Attorney, Mike Satz, we're going to talk about him later, <laughs> uh, issued a statement late this week that said, hey, this is kind of a one-off. Don't worry if you're a police officer. We're not going yeah. to 
just yeah, rig but, it but the right there, that's <laughs> completely wrong. The law doesn't operate right. like exactly. that. Right. Mm -hmm. There's so no one-off in the statute. There is, and, and, and the thing is, now the uh, teachers could have guns in the classroom, right. for example. Right. So now you're going to accuse a teacher for not using a gun mm -hmm. if they had it, and you know, so it complicates matters. A firefighter not going into a, a, right. a building, you and know, at a certain time. To your point, it's a caregiver is the yes, word. Yes, caregiver. Because yes. we, I think we all looked at that and and heard these charges being levied yes. and thought, well, wait a second. I mean, the guy might be a coward. He might have not done something, but is is he a criminal? But the caregiver is who is a it's, caregiver the, in so this society? So the statute society? says it, it's custody or control. Mm -hmm. And right. the question is, what control did right. this resource officer have over that over a thousand children that were in Parkland? Probably not much. Custody. That's that's the argument. But then, what about the lunch lady? Like, where are we stopping when we're going down this road of who's yeah. got custody well, of our kids? Okay. Well, can teachers, I just address that mm -hmm. the lunch lady has a responsibility to serve lunch? And if yeah. a police officer has a responsibility to protect, that is a if the custodial lunch, type. If the of lunch lady sees a fight in the yeah. in, in the cafeteria and does nothing, mm -hmm. has she not taken any Correct. action? Mm -hmm. Has she not intervened? And is that neglect? That's the problem with what they're doing. It's just a one-off. Don't worry. About yeah, that. I know. Right? <laughs> <laughs> but one, one thing I wanted to bring up that I looked at, I actually read the um, the arrest warrant and I read the probable cause. This brings up some for interesting Peterson, concerns, yeah. yes, about Scott Israel, because the warrant for him says that Peterson was trained um, to do this, mm -hmm. and that there were procedures in place for him to go in and save those kids, and now you have Israel facing a Senate um, hearing saying that you did not properly train and you did not have procedures. Yeah. You can't have it both ways with FDLE saying Peterson was trained and he had procedures, so this brings an interesting um, twist to but this. But isn't that um, administrative? Israel. That's an administrative infraction. But, if, but yeah, but if you remove Scott Israel saying you did not properly train and you did not have procedures, but now FDLE arrests an officer saying that he was properly trained and he had procedures, there is one or the other. As a caregiver. And All right, it, everybody, it, hold, hold on, hold to your okay. thoughts. You know, we've got to come back. We're going to talk a little bit about the future of Mike Satz and also the Broward State Attorney's Office. Stay with us.
Welcome back. We are in the midst of a kind of rock and roll roundtable. Actually, very thoughtful, <laughs> not so much rock and roll. Chris Smith, uh, you are a veteran of Broward politics. You've been elected state yeah. house and the state senate from uh, Fort Lauderdale. Now, Mike Sats, I'm going to ask yes. you, given your history of involvement, Mike Sats has been the Broward state attorney since 1976. He announced this week he will not run for re-election, going to devote full time to preparing to be the lead prosecutor in the yes. Nicholas Cruz case. So, what what do you say? I mean, he's been state attorney since I was at Broward State Elementary School. Ouch. Uh, no. <laughs> Mr. Um, Satz, we apologize <laughs> for that comment. <laughs> but no, I, I think Mike has done a, a, a great job, and I mean, the, the diversity in his office he's had for years. But, and, and like you say, sometimes it's good to have some turnover and see some new yeah. direction. But I mean, it creates, if you look at, for years, we had uh, Markham at Property Appraiser, Sats at State Attorney. You had uh, uh, yeah, our constitutional officers were so stable for years, but now you see a change, and, and those changes yeah. happen. He got in under change with coming in with Jimmy Carter, as yeah. we've read, yeah. but now things are changing, and it's time to move forward. Right. Howard Fenkelstein is also going to be yes. leaving yep. at the end of this term as the Broward uh, Public Defender. So. The old guard is changing yes. in Broward and in Miami-Dade as well. The Miami-Dade Commission is going to change profoundly <laughs> Tremendously. next year. It, it's, it's actually an exciting time. Any sort of change like this, if it's wholesale, mm -hmm. it's an exciting time because you're going to hear a lot of new ideas. People are going to discuss different points of view. And hopefully, hopefully, the, the, the population gets to learn something or think about something, take a position on something. Is I, there is there a difference? Miami Dade Commission will be changing largely because term limits are now yes. imposed. Mm -hmm. Is there a difference between stability in a justice system with a state attorney, with a prosecutor, with a public defender, and turnover there versus turnover in elected policy making body? But these are elected positions as well, and forty-five years seems to me like a really, really long time—a lifetime, right? right? For so some, right? Uh, you know, yeah. term limits. I think it's positive. Eight years, I don't know if it's enough. Twelve, mm -hmm. I mean, how many terms? I just think that when you have someone there for over 20 years yeah. in one position, I mean, most of us don't have the same job. And state attorney years, is a policy years. making right. position because for years I was very critical of Mike Satz in his um, charging of juveniles as adults. He kind of led the nation in that for years and then he started pulling back from that. And even yeah. this charge against an officer, you haven't really seen this from him or other state's attorneys. And so they are policy making positions, even as a state yeah. attorney or public defender and sometimes it's good to have those change in policy makers. What do you think about, Stephen, what do you think about him as the lead prosecutor in the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas case? What, why would a state attorney decide I'm going to be the one to do this particular case? Well, a couple of reasons. One, it, 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 it appears to be a pretty open and shut case, so he's not going to really have a high degree of chance of losing it. But I think, two, I was not <laughs> expecting that answer. <laughs> I mean, you know, and that's my legal opinion. But two, and I think more importantly, because if you've spent over 40 years of your life doing something, taking this step this profound step yeah. and, and, yes. and pro this prosecution, you could arguably not have had a more important prosecution yeah. in it's a, your, it's a your legacy, A it's legacy right. case. Yes. Right. Right. Remember. A nice way to, you know, when the chapter. And he's done a lot of cases. I mean, he's done a lot of murder cases. I yeah. remember talking yeah. to him and Chuck Morton, his uh, number two for many years. Yes. I mean, they've tried a lot of cases yeah. together, so it's not like he's stepping back into the courtroom. He's yeah. Yeah. he's done this for a while, and I think in, this will be a good the, one. In the final minute we have left, we just do want to acknowledge the fact that this week we lost one of the really sure. great ones here at Local 10 News, Todd Tongan. Uh, we are heartbroken. We had a big memorial service yesterday, a lot of tears, a lot of laughter, too told some funny stories, but um, I want to thank people at home. They have inundated us with cards and texts and, and emails expressing their sympathy for our loss. Yeah. I'm wearing my purple because of Todd. And oh, yesterday nice. I watched the, the tribute yeah. of all the employees speaking about him, and I cried at home just watching it. It was thank you. You know, very moving. I well, can't look at another taxi cab the same way now. <laughs> no I one mean, can. Right? <laughs> thinking about how much information he brought and humor and, and intellect he brought to South Florida by just driving that cab and having people speak yeah. to us. I mean, it meant so much to South Florida. That, that is going to be the final word. Thank you all for coming in. Great roundtable. So to come, my personal perspective about losing Todd Tom.
Take a look at your screen. It is a live look now from tower cams across South Florida. And here is Weather Authority meteorologist Brandon Orr with the official Sunday forecast. You can see the rain coming down pretty heavy in some of those tower cameras. We can see it here on radar too. We're already getting these thunderstorms developing, not taking long in this type of heat. We're talking about temperatures already well into the 80s, and that's the fuel for these thunderstorms over sunny Isles, back towards Miami Gardens. All of that is pushing northward towards Hollandale, Hollywood. So give yourselves maybe 10, 15 minutes. That rain's going to come down. Also some near Redland. We're also getting this storm in particular is pretty strong. We've been at a Deerfield Beach up towards Boca. So if you're along 95, there's lots of water on the roadway. 50 mile per hour wind gusts at times out of that so, uh, that particular cell, I should say. So 86 right now, we're headed for a high of 91, but with humidity, feels more like 101 degrees right now in Kendall. And it looks like we're gonna be doing this day after day, a hot week ahead, guys. Brandon, thanks. All right, before we leave you this morning, a personal perspective about losing a dear friend and colleague, Todd Tongan. I'm sure you've heard all about it. He took his own life. It shocked us all. We saw no signs of the demons that clearly tormented him. I'm sure you watched Todd over the years here on Local 10. He was hard to miss and a pleasure to watch. An outstanding man, personally, professionally, smart, funny, tart, hugely creative, ready to rock and roll with almost any story. He started out here 30 years ago doing neighborhood weather. Then he did a feature called The 10 Taxi for several years. Then he reinvented himself, became a fine hard news reporter when needed, and a feature story reporter the rest of the time. And for the last 10 years, here they were, Todd co-anchoring the weekend morning news with his great friend, Nikki Mohan. What a team they were. Todd brought a big talent to his work and great energy to our newsroom. Now that he is suddenly gone, there is a vacuum here that we are at a loss to fill. Todd just wasn't another reporter. He was a larger than life personality, a presence. He will have a successor, but nobody will ever replace him. Local 10 viewers have been so phenomenal this week, sending this outpouring of love and caring for Todd and us. Cards, flowers, emails, text. Clearly, a lot of people were touched by Tom Todgan. He certainly touched us. He and I were hired within weeks of each other, became very good friends, which included he would take a few darts at me from time to time. One brief example, I once did a story in which I quoted the famous line from the Rolling Stones and Mick Jagger, you can't always get to what you want. Well, Todd thought I had been way too formal delivering that line. So after the story aired, he marched up to my desk and he told me and everyone else within earshot, Michael Putney says you can't always get what you want. <laughs> it was hilarious, but Todd was making a good point. He was saying, hey, Putney, loosen up. Have some fun with it. Good advice for me and for all of us. Loosen up. Have some fun. Life is serious, but you can laugh along the way. Todd always made us laugh. It was a great gift, and in the end, a terrible responsibility. Todd, we miss you. That is my perspective. I hope you have a wonderful Sunday. Remember, as always, stay informed, get involved. And get online because you can catch any of our shows online right there on local10.com. And you can also subscribe to our This Week in South Florida Roundtable podcast online. We will see you next week. Have a great day. Stay tuned for SoFlo Health right here next week.